Hello, Gargi. Hi. Great Hi, everyone. And uh, we do have some people. <laughs> गुलजार साहब के वहाँ पर कुछ अलग तरह के शेर हैं यहाँ कुछ अलग तरह के शेर हैं बिल्कुल टाइगर्स हैव ऑलवेज सिंबलाइज्ड ग्रेस ब्यूटी मेजेस्टी वैलर ब्रेवरी एंड टेरर दे एंड देयर इंसिस्टर्स हैव रूल्ड दे हैव बीन दी एपेक्स प्रेडेटर्स फॉर मिलियंस ऑफ अर्थ इयर्स वन मिलियन इयर्स बैक दे अराइव्ड इन इंडिया क्रॉसिंग साउथ ईस्ट एशिया एंड स्प्रेड ऑल ओवर द कंट्री they are highly adaptable animals they can survive from minus 40 degree centigrade to plus 40 degree centigrade and uh, they are found in a variety of landscapes in asia they have a high cultural significance in china they are considered uh, symbols of good over evil in india they have a place of honor in mythology culture religion um if you look at pashupati the lord of animals shiv ji he is draped in tiger skin the olden day rishi munis used to meditate on tiger skin um uh, ayappa the uh, deity of sabri mala his hill is surrounded by tigers durga the durg the shakti the fortress she rides a lion or a tiger uh singh asan the seat where a king sat was the seat of lion or tiger so the kings and monarchs have always hunted them yet revered them um uh, uh, and they, you will find them on their flags their emblems their you know seals um and um, uh, the oldest tiger seal is from indus valley civilization 70% of the wild tigers of the world are found in india today and unfortunately in the last 100 years their numbers have gone down to almost 90% um and they have always inspired awe and literature and poetry and in fact gargi's uh, uh first novel tiger season is a breezy romance set in a tiger reserve in india so gargi what led you to choose this particular setting for your first novel well, thank you so much for that arifa um so as a reporter with ndtv uh, for the last 20 years i've been very fortunate to be able to report on these issues that mean a lot to me it's the reason i joined journalism issues of environment and wildlife and uh, at ndtv we did a series of save our tiger campaigns because uh, people didn't realize while we're very proud of our tiger numbers and we yes we have uh, the maximum wild tigers uh, in india in india them themselves they they were in crisis and when we started our campaign there were just 14 11 tigers left in the country according to the estimation that was done scientifically for the first time uh, so that is when we began our campaign and uh, it, you know we went all the way to the prime minister we presented him uh, with a with a application to you know commit to saving the tigers we got a lot of children involved and during the course of my reportage and then our campaign continued for several years there are lots of aspects of tiger conservation that i saw that i felt i wanted to share with people and it's very important people know because while we all love tigers there's a, there are various issues that are involved which is uh, which is necessary for people to be aware about absolutely and when when you spoke so beautifully about you know the significance of tigers in india but it's not just in india even in uh, some uh, you know foreign uh, can in some of their flags you'll find the tiger uh, it, it, a child sitting in scandinavia if, uh, if he's asked what is your favorite animal they'll say tiger even though they've never seen a tiger in real life and maybe never will but that is the you know the magic the mystique of a tiger that people love it so much so there was a lot to be said uh, about all the issues around tiger conservation so that is the reason that uh, you know i thought it's important to write this book so people while they love tigers they must also understand all the efforts and all the you know nuances of tiger conservation and and all the stakeholders especially the villagers who live around tiger parks it's important to talk about them and bring you know their absolute stories out as well yeah and, and yeah. about your books as well i mean you've written so many books for children especially you know focusing on wildlife tell us a bit about that of course you learned from your father as well and you've had such a you know blessed uh, childhood growing up here in rajasthan and uh, seeing wildlife and so had you actually <laughs> <laughs> with your father and family um yeah so i would rather that children know the names of birds and animals and insects than cars and celebrities and brands So um of course I come from a family of naturalists 
uh, and some of the earliest big game hunters turned nationalist of India. Um, so with my father, he used to, of course, take us to the forests and he has put me inside the cages of leopards and bears and crocodiles and pythons so that I lose all fear of animals and I did with the animal there? Yeah, with the animal there. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, yeah, so obviously when I started writing, the setting came naturally to me. It had to be about <laughs> wildlife, it had to be about animals, and the whole entire family is of nature lovers. My grandfather, before independence, he had the monopoly of arms and ammunition business in Mewar state of India. And after independence, he was a pioneer of mining in Rajasthan, in southern Rajasthan. And in those days, there was no ceiling on the amount of land you could lease, lease from the government. So he had eight mines and each one was around 40 miles long. So it was a vast forested track which was inhabited more by wild animals than by humans. So, um, uh, and he did a lot of work for tribal upliftment. Topa Wala Babu Aya is one of the songs they used to sing for him, uh, the tribals. And my father was looking after one of those mines. So he used to live in a small tattered hut, which was also cohabited by snakes and scorpions. And whenever it would rain, he would have to shift his cot from one part of the co you know, cottage to the other because all the water would come in. It was a secluded hut uh, in Dholi Ghati Valley. For five square kilometers, there was no habitation. And uh, there were these gangs of decoys that used to operate in those areas. Uh, but they kept away from him because he had a rifle and these people, they generally had muzzle loader guns. Uh, so they generally kept away from him. And uh, every day he would go to the mines and come back. It was five kilometers away in the hills. He would find 15 to 20 tribals waiting for him. Uh, there were no NGOs. There, was, there were no government hospitals operating in those areas in those days. So he used to live there as a hunter, a doctor, and a hermit. So he, he used to keep three basic medicines for diarrhea malaria and guinea worm disease. I don't know if you know guinea worm disease. No. So it's a terrible disease and it, it, it goes into the worm goes in, uh, into your body through water. Uh, the eggs go inside the body and then the life cycle of the worm happens there. And they can pop out from any part of uh, in your body and they'll, the, only the head will pop out and they'll be just sitting there. So you can't pull them out. If you pull them out, they break and they again regrow in the body. So he would have a lot of uh, these tribals who had guinea worms in their bodies. So he would first inject some chemical in it for them to go limp because he could not pull them out. Then call them the next day, take a stick, then very slowly, you know, roll the whole worm out. They are quite long uh, and then dress the wound. And sometimes he would have uh, these tribals with hundreds of guinea worms in their bodies, even popping out of their tongues and eyes and he could not and there you was know, no other medical help. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing around. available. So he has told me how, you know, uh, sometimes he would go with a gun and, you know, hunt a deer or something and then distribute the meat in them because they were very protein starved. But they lived in abject misery. And he said that he has seen people dig roots and, and shoots and eat them and die of starvation. So if from such a family, a cattle was killed the end, by a tiger right. or a leopard, the entire family was, would die of starvation. So off and on, my father and my grandfather, they both used to requ uh, receive requests first from the Maharana and then from the government of India to cull the cattle lifters and man-eaters. So um, uh, talking about the man-animal conflict, I think e uh, while reading your book, I realized that you have also witnessed one very closely, Ustad. I'm sure everyone knows about yes, T24. So, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is uh, here in Ranthambore, uh, we had an episode in 2015 when this very popular tiger, his name was Ustad, T24. Our first department doesn't want you usually to name them, just give them a number. So uh, it, it was a tiger that killed a forest guard, a guard who was uh, you know, at the gate. He'd just gone uh, behind the gate in the brush just to see what was happening. And the tiger attacked and dragged his body away. And I remember receiving a call. I was in Delhi that time from some of the tiger lovers. And they were like, you know, this has happened. And now the forest department. And you know, they're making this story. We don't even know if it's Ustad. And they're going to move him out of the park, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, at that time, I, I, you know, obviously, then it became a, I went to Ranthambore. As I'm very fortunate to be with NDTV that you know, all these issues we've always focused on a lot. 
And uh, what really happened there was that the forest department took the decision to remove Ustad because this was the fourth person that this tiger had killed. Now, I think in India, we are very, um, uh, you know, we, we, we wait for the tiger to kill at least two to three people before we take action. And this was the fourth person that was killed. The forest department wanted this tiger out because this is the second forest personnel who had been killed. The villagers wanted him out because he used to come, sit on the road, he used to go into the villages, he was a cattle lifter as well. So all sorts of things, but he was also one of the celebrity tigers of Ranthambore. Who, you know, everybody used to photograph him, uh, everybody, uh, you know, used to visit and have amazing sightings of Ustad. So it was incredible to see the kind of outpouring that happened at that time uh, with people coming out onto the streets in Lucknow, in Bangalore, in Delhi with candles and, you know, the whole candlelight vigil of Save Ustad, which is a great, I mean, it's lovely that people have so much love for tigers and, you know, they're willing to come out onto the streets. But it was also very misplaced because this was a problem animal. I'm, that is what he is, and, and, and I'm sorry if that offends some of the tiger lovers, but it was a problem animal, and I've spoken uh, during the course of my reportage, I spoke to many tiger conservationists and scientists, and they all said, if there is a problem animal, you have to remove him. There are no two ways about that. The forest department had him tranquilized and sent to a, a, a zoo in Udaipur. But there was such a hue and cry, it went into the courts, it, it, it was like, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, aspersions were being cast on the forest department and their motivations. When I reported it, a lot of aspersions were cast on me and my motivations. But I spoke to people like Valmik Thapar, Anish Andheria, Ulas Karant, and these are very respected names in the space of tiger conservation. And they all agreed that because uh, that you had to remove this tiger because you cannot have that because of a tiger, Ustad, that, that people in the area, the villagers who live around and the forest department, uh, you know, the villagers then are a very strong partner in conservation. But if you alienate them or upset them in this manner, then you are endangering the other 50 tigers who are also in the park. Because the next time a cattle is killed, they will poison it. And then the tiger will die. Instead, right now, if a cattle is killed, they go to the forest department, they get compensation, NGOs come forward. That is how it works. So in the course of my book, uh, there is an episode like, like this. It's of an attack. It, I didn't uh, make it of a, of a person being killed. And I've also interviewed one of our, the forest, one of the rangers from Ranthabur who in the past was attacked by a tiger. His uh, you know, skull was torn and he was airlifted to Jaipur. And even today he's there in, in Ranthabur. He continues to you know, work to protect tigers even though he was the victim of uh, such a you know, horrific attack. That tiger interestingly went all the way uh, to Bharatpur for some time, and then he was the one who was captured and kept in Sariska. Sariska is one of our parks that lost all its tigers to poaching. Uh, so this tiger was then sent there. So yes, so I felt through my book, through the little bit of romance and Bollywood and adventure, etc., I've tried to put these themes as well so that people, you know, it's wonderful to love tigers, but you have to also understand all the other aspects that go into protecting tigers and protecting tiger parks Absolutely. and some respect for the forest department as well as for the villagers, you know, who live around that area. And, uh, you know, very often I've seen that th these, uh, these issues, uh, every time it comes up, there's a lot of people you know speak out for the tiger but they don't think of the others involved like we had the avni episode in maharashtra which is again a uh, tigress and she was with her cubs it was sad but the area she was in was one of the poorest as you've described you know the sort of tribal area where even one day those people didn't go out to work they don't they don't have food that day you know it, it was like that and avni again she killed at least 13 people and even then in in bombay etc when a lot of people wrote about it they they really, uh, you know, made it out into this very dramatic story. There's this tigress, she's fighting for her cubs, and, you know, everybody's after her. But no, somehow, I don't know why in our cities we have no sympathy for the poor and the villagers and the tribals who are actually bearing the brunt of our tiger conservation, which we must continue doing, but not alienate these people. Yeah, otherwise it cannot be sustainable. You can't sustain that. And talking about that, in fact, since I mentioned this guinea worm thing, uh, many years later, I would like to say that that uh, uh, when my father and his brothers, they later on after independence, many years later started a plastic in, uh, manufacturing unit, along with the United Nations, they, de they actually designed a um, um, filter for guinea worm and distributed free of cost in Rajasthan. And the UN has declared it completely guinea worm free today. That's wonderful. That's wonderful to know. But 
uh, now we are in Rajasthan. Rajasthan has Ranthambo, one of the most, um, you know, one of the most popular tiger reserves. But uh, let's talk about the rest of the state as well, and the you know the state of the wildlife there in southern Rajasthan, where you are right. from. Right. Yeah, I'm from Udaipur. So uh, before that, uh, a brief history of tigers in India. Sure. So. Um, as I said, they were always revered in India by kings and, kings and monarchs. Some of them, they excessively hunted tigers. When you look at the Marana of Reva, uh, it was a tradition to hunt 109 tigers, you know, at the time of coronation. Or even if you look at uh, Marana Fateh Singh Ji of Mewar, he is known to have shot more than 200 tigers. But the what about the, the, in my book, I talk about one of the Rajas having that tiger car. It was yeah, a Rolls yeah, Royce, one of the kings, yes. I can't remember, was it Bharatpur, Bikaner, one of them, fitted with, a, with guns in front and used to drive this Rolls Royce out and, and it, had one, it had a little cannon at the yes. back and just go around shooting. I mean, that is how it used to be back in the day. Yes, but uh, ironically, there were still tigers then, despite all this. Um, and in fact, but you have had uh, even uh, kings like Tipu Sultan, Sher e Mesur, he was called the uh, tiger of Mesur, he was a lover of tigers. He had tigers everywhere, on his flags, on his emblems, on his coins, on his soldiers' uniforms, even on his watermarks and book bindings. And the toy tiger <laughs> that he had, which is shown to be depicted to be killing a white soldier. It's a mechanical yeah, life. He was taunting studies. the British. It was like a, it, as a white guy, a white soldier, British soldier, yeah. and this tiger's. And it was just a toy. He could do that, and the tiger's just yes. jumping. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Because Tipu Sultan was anyway an eyesore, a, a, a fish's bone stuck in the you know neck of British anyway at that time. And uh, so his, this, this particular toy tiger is in fact a very popular exhibit, exhibit in uh, Albert and Victoria Museum in London now. Um, uh, so he, when he was killed in the last anglo mesur war, the bravery medals that the British gave out to soldiers had the lion, which is there on the British emblem, mauling the Indian tiger. And uh, in fact, uh, the day Tipu died after that, it was declared a public holiday in Britain to celebrate his death. Uh, so tigers have always been a very, very important part of our culture. Uh, you, you look at the Rajput surname Singh, you know, they put Singh after the surname to kind of describe the valor and bravery. Uh, but the, uh, when the British came to India, they started treating tiger as vermin, as the dreaded savage. When you look at the Jungle Book, uh, Sher Khan is the villain. Sher is a Khan, he's an emperor, and he's a villain, and he needs to be killed. And by the end of the book, Mowgli, uh, you know, kills Sher Khan, and he, uh, in, a, in a gesture of triumph, he uh, drapes uh, his skin around his body. So British calculated the amount of damage that, you know, tigers were doing in India, and the question was raised in the British Parliament. Uh, there it was decided to put a bounty on the head of the tigers. In 1882 alone, 4,800 pounds were given away as rewards for killing 1,726 tigers. Oh my God. Mm. But of course, there were many uh, sensible scientists and naturalists in Britain who actually uh, opposed this assault on tiger and finally it was called off. But the real race of extinction, extinction, tiger extinction started when the British started to clear the forests of India for timber and for laying down the Indian railways, which we tend to be forever grateful to them for. Um, that's when it all started. And even in 1900, with such mass scale destruction of forests, there was still an estimated 100,000 tigers in India. Uh, and every year, in fact, in early 1900s, a thousand people were killed by tigers. But yet it was not a man versus beast tale, unlike, you know, uh, putting a bounty on the head or things like that. In 1947, at the time of independence, there were an estimated 40,000 tigers. And uh, after independence, so all these hunting reserves that were preserved during the royalty, the time of the royalty and monarchy, were suddenly free for all. So in southern Rajasthan, as you were saying, the government, they seized weapons from the Royal Armoury 
and they just sold it at throwaway prices to the population, to all the masses. So suddenly you had no rules and regulation and you had this entire populace armed with good quality weapons. So that is when the massacre of wildlife started in Rajasthan. Uh, in southern Rajasthan. Before that, tigers were there in Panarwa, they were there in Jaisaman, they were there in Kumbalgarh. In fact, there was this saying in Panarwa, in, in Mewar, that every five, of every five tigers born in Mewar, three are born in Panarwa. Panarwa is the thickest forest of southern Rajasthan. By 1970s, forget about the tigers, there was no wildlife remaining at all in Panarwa except the birds. So the so-called natives had outdid the British. And in 1973, uh, Indira Gandhi came up with Project Tiger amidst wide international support. Uh, and that, uh, the, the drive towards tiger conservation was started then by kickstarting nine uh, tiger reserves, if I'm not mistaken. And now we have over 50 tiger reserves in the country. That's quite amazing. Yeah, and over and 50, 54, yeah. You know, and the way you've described the poverty, and uh, one has to appreciate the fact that in the 70s, and it was a lot of tiger lovers, uh, Belinda Wright's mother, Anne Wright, who recently yeah. passed away, who approached Indira Gandhi and said that, you know, if we don't do anything, you're going to lose tigers in this country. And kudos to her and the bunch of officers at that time who uh, you know, uh, w were very passionate about it that could, in the midst of this very deep poverty and uh, the tribals, etc., we did manage to carve out these spaces, these tiger reserves that have remained inviolate, which is incredible. And it's thanks to that today that you know now it's 50 tiger reserves, uh, despite everywhere else in the world you've had, and, and there are pressures, the developmental pressures, but everywhere else in the world you've cleared out forests and had plantations and had industry happening. At the same time, I think now there's also a lot of awareness that uh, our, um, these tiger reserves and Project Tiger was done on the back of many nameless, countless tribals and villagers who were moved out of there ancestral villages, in, 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 you can go to these parks in Bandhavgarh, Ranthambur, etc. And you know the fault department will say, this is called so-and-so uh, Kheti or some such, such and such grasslands and it used to be where a village used to be. And at that time there were no, no human rights activists like we have today and today it's become a, a somewhat of a bad word sadly in India. But uh, you know, so these villages were just moved out. They were literally, the forest department would go and pick up and just chuck them out of the, the forest and it's, and we must all appreciate their sacrifice as well, I feel, to date. Absolutely. Today, though, uh, a forest, uh, if you're being asked to move out, where, which is still the case in Gir, you have Maldharis, they're being asked to move out. In Corbett, you have the Gujars, you know, the villages, they're being asked to move out. You get 10 lakhs per adult. So that is thanks to all the activists, all the tribal activists, human rights activists, that today the government has, you know, brought out this package. So that's wonderful, but at the same time, we must appreciate that sacrifice that was made then as well as the thought that went into creating these tiger parks. So thank God today we have these inviolate spaces that are under threat today as well from mining and developmental projects and, you know, dams and uh, you, the even Ken Bethwa. Even agriculture. Even agriculture. So, I mean, it's quite incredible to see despite the poverty that India had that we managed to save so much of our wildlife and so much of our tigers. Absolutely, absolutely agree. And at the time of Project Tiger, that is what my father had also said, um, that we need to involve the local communities uh, if we have to, you know, look at tiger conservation for the long run. And as you said, many countries have already lost their tigers. The Javan tiger, the Caspian tiger, the Bali tiger, they have gone extinct in the last few decades. So we do not, so in fact, even for Southern Rajasthan, that's what my father has been proposing, that although uh, the tigers are extinct from there, there is still the tiger corridor that exists for migration. It used to start in Panarwa, the tigers used to migrate to Jaisamand, and then they would go to the border of Ajmer and cross into Madhya Pradesh. So he had given, uh, along with me, uh, he had given a proposal to the forest department that there is one fragmented patch in between in Sarveni to declare that as a forest reserve so that again tigers can start migrating from Madhya Pradesh uh, to Rajasthan. But let's see whenever that happens. Right, because in India we have this uh, situation where a lot of places you have huge numbers and it's become something of, as we're talking, conflict, a lot of issues there. You have Corbett, you have Bandhavgarh, you have Ranthambore, but then you have other parks that barely have any tigers and we really need now 
to talk about you know tiger landscape management so that from a corbett uh, the tigers can move to a rajaji national park which is more near dehradun and and tigers have in fact travel traverse these areas but we have to make them safer a lot of the times when the tigers move out of these protected areas is when they get poached because that is still a very real uh, fear for you know the tigers in the country uh, we have the demand coming from the eastern you know side of the world from china from korea etc the demand for tiger bones tiger wine etc and uh, and somehow the uh, for a wild tiger it's even more because you do have chi uh, tiger farms in china but even so they feel the real deal is to get you know one of the wild tigers uh, from uh, india and ha and use that that's considered more powerful so yes i mean and, and look at the kind of uh, you know different sort of habitats tigers are found in from rajasthan all the way till the sundarbans where you can see tigers swimming you know in in that uh, in, in between yeah between the uh, two islands and eating crabs and eating Yes, yes, absolutely. Highly adaptable animal. Uh, so, talking about this conservation, Gargi, what do you think is the role of celebrities in bringing about awareness? Because you have worked with a few celebrities to bring about tiger conservation awareness in India. How effective is that? That's right. No, it is, it is some, I mean, end of the day, uh, in India, we are very Bollywood, uh, starstruck and very, uh, you know, it's either Bollywood or cricket. Those are the two, you know, big things that attract uh, the masses and everyone. So, yes, at NDTV, while we've done various campaigns, be it Greenathon, be it Save Our Tigers, and we've always found it very helpful to get a Bollywood star involved because while, I mean, a lot of you sitting here, obviously you're here because you like to know about conservation and about tigers, but there's so many who are there you know with gulzar saab and you know would rather hear something uh, from him and if gulzar saab spoke about tiger conservation how amazing would that be you know because that whole crowd that is more interested in in maybe bollywood maybe uh, poetry etc then they would learn something about conservation as well so similarly for save our tigers we had amita bachchan uh, one of the biggest bollywood stars there is in india and uh, i have to say he was very interested very curious it's wonderful to see that you know how much he wanted to know about uh, tigers and the issues etc and uh, and we 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 had ms dhoni we took him to uttarakhand and made him meet the chief minister who immediately made him an honorary wildlife warden of uttarakhand at the time but yes it, it you know then it attracts so many more people so i've talked about it a little bit in my book tiger season it's about an environment reporter and a tiger campaign and a bollywood star and man animal conflict so it it always helps and i think even in my book i didn't want to make it too dry while those of you who love tigers and conservation would read it just for the description of wildlife and animals and the issues uh, but uh, you know some just read it oh it's uh, it's also romance it's also got some bollywood so let's read it so i think similar to what we've done at ndtv i've kind of used it in my book as well to have a little bit of you know fun and bollywood yeah. And I think even the ranger that you mentioned now, I can put two and two together since I have read the book and I yes. know that, you know, he would have undergone the same thing that you have described there. So when you have a close encounter with any big cat, a tiger, leopard, lion, anything, you cannot remo remain unmoved. Do you have any such experience which is quite memorable with any of these big cats? Well, uh well, one of the experiences was to see this tigress, very one of the most famous tigresses we've had in this country uh, called Machli. Uh, she was uh, from Ranthambore. And, uh, you know, she lived to a very grand old age of, I don't know, 18, 19 years, which wild tigers don't live that uh, till that age. And I remember seeing her, my last sighting was after, you know, she disappeared. She was around 14 when her, her daughters took over her territory. They chased her out. And, you know, she was occupying a very small territory at that time. And she was one of the fiercest tigresses there were. All those videos of her fighting, you know, crocodiles, you know, killing with her cubs. And she produced a lot. That's the other thing about tigers. You know, leave them be. They will produce and they will just, you know, go on and, and, and just populate the area. Unlike giant pandas that you can just leave them. You can even do whatever you want but still they'll produce maybe one in a course of many years tigers that way there's no issue they just go on and they produce and it's that's one of the good things about tiger conservation so yes muchly's last sighting as i said she would disappear bbc would you know they'd they'd be filming with her and then they'd end their documentary by saying and then muchly the legend continues and she's now dead and then she'd appear again so they, they would have to redo that bit so yes, I think seeing Machli, uh, when I went to Ranthambore, one of the last times, it was a sighting after a very long time. And interestingly, that uh, you know, the forest department would 
we all know, and I've seen it myself, like a goat being kept out, etc. because she was really old. Uh, she could not hunt. She had broken a lot of her teeth fighting with crocodiles. So they would always leave a, a goat out for her when they felt she'd you know, been a long time without eating. And that amounts to interference to a certain extent. And, and you know, people are always like, no, one shouldn't interfere. But I think there was just so much uh, respect, admiration, law, legend around Machli that even the forest department was like, no, we cannot just let her die out like another, any other tiger. And, and similarly, I saw in Bandhavgar, uh, Machli's contemporary was B2, this male tiger there, and he was also like very famous, most photographed. And uh, there as well, I think towards his last years, they, they did help him out. But uh, so that, that's one of those things, you know, there's just so much love and respect. And people used to actually donate for, they used to call it charhava, you know, that they're sacrificing. So they would pay for that goat and they would feel very blessed that, you know, we have paid for it. And <laughs> it's almost like you go to a mandir and, you know, you, you, you uh, contribute. So similarly, they used to feel that Machli was just such a legend. Yeah, she was a legend. She was iconic, in fact. So I can imagine how <laughs> memorable that whole uh, experience would have been. Um, and what about yours? Yeah, so even when I was growing up, Daddy used to take us to forests all the time. Uh, even when I'm, I, I, you were asking about my wildlife books as well. So he has always said that the way to connect children with nature is not through preaching or teaching. It is through stories. And that is how I started writing my books on wildlife for children and adults as well. Um, and also, of course, he used to take us to the forests. We don't, as you know, we don't have any more tigers in southern Rajasthan now. But we did have a few experiences with leopards. And one of them is quite memorable. So every summer, we would spend in the forests in Rajasthan. That summer, we had gone to the forest of Kumbalgarh. And there, we used to stay at the forest chalky there, which are very basic accommodation yes. inside the forest. Uh, and there was a stream passing by right outside. Every, it was very warm. It was the peak of summer. It was hot. It was sweltering. But still, everyone wanted to sleep inside the forest chalky because of, obviously, because of fear of animals. So my father and I decided to sleep outside, near the stream. So there were these two basic cots that were put near the stream. And we both slept there. In the morning when we got up, we saw fresh pug marks of a leopard that had passed between my and my father's cot at night. So I have learned a lot of lessons in my life from the wild. And the lesson that I learned that day, now that leopard had obviously come to drink water to the stream. It drank water and then it just went away. So the lesson that I learned was that you are welcome to stay in my home as long as I can have my drink. <laughs> but even other than that, the lessons that I have learned from the wild that our animals are very large hearted. How many of us will remain nonchalant if there is a leopard in our home? Forget about our home, in our garden, in our lanes, in our city, we will not rest in peace till the time it is captured or even killed after that. So which, we, which is actually now happening in, in Delhi, in South Delhi, uh, you know, scenic farms. We've had a leopard sighting there. People have been very agitated in Bangalore at one of the, uh, you know, institutes. A leopard had come in there as well. And they, they eventually, they tried to capture it, but they shot it at, it at the end of it. So, yes, uh, it's very much there that we're seeing a lot of, you know, wild animals and, and leopards especially, I think, uh, because they're, they're so easily adaptable. But I think... Um, uh, in, in the, in the uh, cities, uh, the people are not, you know, they're not used to ha living with animals or living or knowing about leopards or how to behave. And that creates a lot of panic and fear. So I think yes, and also the encroachment because we are going inside their forests every, you know, every year, every month we are encroaching in their land. So obviously they are, they will spill into the city at right. some point I, of time. I also wanted to ask you about tourism. Now tourism is something that somehow gets, um, you know, we, we all see those pictures of a tiger and 20 jeeps around it and all of us like, oh, so bad, so terrible and all. But the point is, tourism is a very good tool for conservation. And I think I've talked about that it in is. my book as well. And we need to use it, you know, in a way that it, it's also eyes on the park because how much is the forest department going to see? And where, and sometimes, as, is, as has happened in Corbett, it was a tourist many years, this is decades ago, when a tourist was the one who saw a dead elephant. And that is when we realized that the elephants were being poached for their tusks and the forest department somehow had not got to that area or maybe some of them were hand in glove. So, you know, 
in that sense, tourism, as well as uh, providing income for the locals. So that, I think, is one of the ways in which we need to use tourism, A, for income for locals, as well as, um, you know, in, in, as a way of uh, creating you know, w uh, more awareness around all our tiger parks and absolutely. our wild animals, not just tigers, all animals. All, all wild animals, absolutely. I completely agree that tourism is a very potent thing for conservation. Some other countries have hunting, for example. They give out licenses, one or two or three licenses at, you know, exorbitant prices and then they use the same amount for conservation. And ironically, as I was saying, before independence, the hunting reserves of the Maranas and royalty, they were much well protected than the sanctuaries and national parks of the independent India, that is because obviously the laws and regulations were so strict then uh, that they could not hunt and then you know it all went down. So tourism remains, even when you look at the major uh, sanctuaries and national parks of India, most of them have been the erstwhile hunting grounds of you know uh, the royalty then. So tourism is a potent tool and it should be used to its full potential. Of course, regularized tourism. Yes. But uh, that is one of the most potent tools that we have to involve the local communities so that they feel a part of tiger or wildlife conservation. Right. And, and, uh, and when we're talking about, you know, tiger landscapes right now, a lot of our tigers are in fact, outside of protected areas, and our wildlife is outside of protected areas, and many are working on the ground, activists, NGOs, forest department, to identify these areas from where the tigers can move, you know, from one park to another. So even if we have, we figure out some sort of tourism plan for those areas to benefit the, you know, because now we need to take back some of the agricultural land, rewild it, you know, make it safer for animals to pass through. So if in some way it can benefit the locals in some way if we can you know have them as a with with tourism and you know be a part of that uh, that's the way to make it work for them unfortunately it has to work for the poor we can all sit in cities in our safe uh, environments and say no we have to have these tiger landscape and we have to have you know safe forest corridors but unless we make it work for the people who actually live there uh, it won't be successful so i think Absolutely. a lot of thought needs to go into that now when we're looking forward what next for tiger conservation in india we have over 70 percent of the world's wild tigers you know we are known as the tiger nation people come here from all over the world just to see that tiger so we need to uh, figure out you know better ways of using it as well as protecting tigers and our, our uh, forests, because let's face it, from a lot of these forests uh, that are today tiger parks is where our rivers come from, is where we now we know that the best protection against climate change is forests, is, you know, just having the trees, leaving it be, and, uh, and thanks to Project Tiger and all our protected areas that we have such a wealth of forest today that we need to yes. now, you know, use that and realize uh, and appreciate it more. Absolutely. And we also need to make tiger corridors for them to migrate, start migrating again because now the sanctuaries and all the wildlife exists only in pockets all over the country where at some point of time, not, not very long back, they used to migrate all over. So that is another very important thing that needs to be done to you know, connect all the national parks and sanctuaries through wildlife forested corridors. And while reading your book, I also came across an instance where you have uh, spoken about the stray dogs, the feral dogs, and you know what a big threat they are to wildlife. And it's very difficult to talk about uh, the stray dog problem in India because, I mean, again, like I said, the tiger lovers, and then there are the dog lovers, and the ones who love to feed dogs in all our cities, etc. But it's it's a huge problem and one that I think we need to address sooner than later because it's the poor again who suffer the dog bites. People I know are bitten by dogs when they're going jogging, but uh, people who are just going for their livelihood are bitten by stray dogs. It's also a menace for wildlife now. In Ladakh, I mean recently, I don't know how many of you have seen this uh, uh, snow leopard cub. It was on, on top of a little uh, you know, pillar or something. It was surrounded by these feral dogs and it's become a huge problem in many parts of the country. We have what, some of the highest incidence of rabies, of dog bites. We have children being killed by dogs. So at some point, our love for dogs, we have to figure out how we're going to handle this, you know, uh, free-ranging dogs that we have in the country. And in every yeah, place, it's a problem. So, uh, but that, it's, it's a very controversial thing. If you say it anywhere, you, you know, usually get attacked a lot. <laughs> that is right. You will be. But you have to talk about the actual constraints of wildlife conservation and what are the practical measures to address these issues. And it doesn't have to be an either-or situation. Dogs can be neutered. There are a billion dogs world over, estimated. And how many tigers are there? in the world. 
So, you know, and even uh, they are a threat to wildlife. I was reading this article on BBC and it said that 12 species have already gone extinct because of feral dogs. And there are 200 more, many of which are critically endangered, which are threatened by dogs. And one of them in, in fact, southern Rajasthan is the great Indian bustard. That's right. Only 100 are left and one of the major th threats is feral dogs. So you have to address these problems if you have to talk about wildlife conservation. And it's one of the reasons for, for, from Ghee that we wanted an alternative, uh, you know, population of lions because of the stray dogs, they, they cause a lot of distemper, canine distemper, and that is a problem for uh, the big cats as well. So that was the fear, but uh, of course now the rest is history because at that time our Prime Minister was the Chief Minister and he did not allow a population of lions to be moved to what is now the Cheetah Park Kuno. Uh, we were meant to have another population, so we'd have at least two populations of lions in the country so they could be protected. But now we have a, a cheetah. I don't want to get into the cheetah discussion right. because there's a whole other discussion about how much money we're pouring into uh, these you know, 20 cheetahs that have come from Africa, whereas we could have been using that money and that effort and that energy into protecting, like we said, you know, making these tiger uh, corridors and uh, even uh, caracal for that reason is on the brink of extinction. Nobody is even talking about those animals which are like. You know. And the great Indian bustard, we could have yeah. used that money for them. You know, it's interesting how uh, uh, an attractive animal and, and tigers are attractive, peacocks are attractive, whereas the great Indian bustard, I remember that. I think at Independence, it, there was a proposal, maybe it was Salim Ali, I can't remember, who said, make this the national bird. But, ev but everybody felt, no, it's not that attractive. It doesn't look that good. So we made the peacock our national uh, bird. But uh, if it had been the great Indian busted, maybe it would have been uh, not in the state that it is today. Perhaps. I think we are running out of time, so I'll just conclude this. And uh, so we, at the time that we started, uh, Project Tiger, we had 1,800 something tigers, which were just below 2,000. Today, we have 3,000 tigers in India approximately. So there is a long way to go. Tigers are on the brink of extinction. And uh, the Royal Bengal Tiger, it is as much as its country as it is ours. So we must act. And uh, to wind up, I just remember uh, Professor Vaseem Barelvi's share, Ars Kiya hai. कि मैं बुझ गया तो हमेशा को बुझ ही जाऊंगा मैं बुझ गया तो हमेशा को बुझ ही जाऊंगा कोई चराग नहीं हूं कि फिर जला लेगा थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू एनी क्वेश्चंस वी हैव 5 मिनट्स फॉर दैट ओह वी डू ओके नमस्ते मैम एंड कांग्रेचुलेशंस फॉर योर बुक आई लव द वे यू राइट एंड आल्सो फॉर बीइंग द वॉइस फॉर वाइल्ड लाइफ बट uh, my question is why, uh, I mean, of course, tigers are the fascinating animals, but why only tigers are considered as the flagship species when it comes to wildlife conservation? And uh, as uh, representatives of wildlife, what role can we play to bring other lesser known forms to the mainstream media? And uh, give no, them just absolutely justice. right. I mean, we do talk tigers, tigers, yes. but when we when Which we say play equally role in the environment, of course, Thank when we you. say save our tigers, we also mean save that. Uh, environment that the tiger has found, save those forests and thanks to saving tigers there's so many other species that also get uh, you know saved or protected in the process and uh, but we've also talked about elephants in, in India we've had project elephant but now there's an effort to I think club together both the uh, conservation efforts uh, in India we also I have uh, filmed the dolphins in the Ganga uh, that again it's a species that you know, it represents our water bodies, the Ganga, if, if the Ganga is more polluted, which sadly it is, you know, the, the dolphins' uh, numbers decrease. So there is a lot more also going on, and we always uh, try and highlight this, the Great Indian Bustard now. In the last couple of years, we've been talking a lot about, a lot of reporting has gone into that. So yes, when we say tigers, I think it, it's just representative of uh, all the wildlife that India has to offer, and we have so much to offer, and it's great that young people should be aware, more involved, you know, uh, share on social media, talk about it and um, support, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky that I came from a time in NDTV when we could do these kind of reports and it wasn't, today there's so many channels and it's all about the latest controversy and the latest Hindu-Muslim issue and the latest who said what and opposition and ED and CBI, 
but fortunately back in the day NDTV was able to focus a, lo a lot on these issues that really matter and you know wanting to bring about change wanting to build that pressure saying that there're just 14 11 tigers left let's all work together getting commitments from chief ministers and prime ministers at that time to commit to you know protecting these animals so we're very lucky i think that that sort of reportage and tv news has gone it's an era gone by now but yes we must keep speaking and making our voice heard we must do that <laughs> yeah more than ever now yes thank you uh, we come from South Africa, and I believe we are sending 70 cheetahs to you. And the first 15, some of them have died in transport. Yes. What is the chances, you know, with cheetahs being uh, endangered, there's only, I think, 6,000 left in the world. What are the chances of them being re-established in India? I think, I mean, I think a lot of uh, conservationists, etc., really question the cheetah project that we have. It's going to be very difficult because right now they're kept in this very, uh, you know, big enclosure. Deer were got so that they would have, you know, a, a prey base. But what's happening is often the uh, the male cheetahs, especially, they're they're saying, oh, they're they're running away, but not running away. They're, they're just doing what animals do, and they're going off into villages, and then these teams are going tranquilizing them, bringing them back. And I, I fear that one of the reasons that so many have died is because of this constant, you know, tension to the animal, this constant, like, bringing them back, that because suddenly they'll appear here and there. I, I really hope, and I think a lot of conservationists right now are very careful talking about it, and they, they try to put a positive spin on it, and we're all hopeful that we will see them in the, in the grasslands, etc. cetera, but uh, because they're already here. You know, so we already have, we've taken the South Namibian cheetahs, the South African cheetahs, they're already here. There are proposals to bring more and put them in other locations, but I think it's just going to be like a, a glorified, uh, not a zoo, but a protected yeah. enclosure. Absolutely. And you know, you put them in other areas, you're putting so much energy into it. I, and money. And, and this is nothing to do with this current government because I remember this proposal came from Jairam Ramesh when he was the environment minister at the time. And I remember saying this is a daft idea then as well, internally in NDTV also I said it. I think this is the worst idea. How can we do this? And my boss at the time, Pranoy Roy, he felt, oh no, but it's so lovely. We'll bring them back. You know, we'll have cheetahs in our grasslands again. I was like, boss, it's, it's going to take too much energy. But anyway, here we are. So this government did bring the cheetahs. Let's see what happens. Okay, one quick question last, maybe. We have just two minutes, right? <laughs> you, can, you can give to the old gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. For whoever else has questions, we can talk later. <laughs> Hello. Um, a comment, if I may. Sure. I'm an animal historian, so I'll make a few corrections. The figure of 40,000 tigers that you gave was of 1900, and it was worked out by EPG, the English tea planter. The figure of the number of tigers was challenged by Ranjit Singh and Kailash Sakla in 1900, and they brought it down to between 25 and 30,000. Nobody, I repeat, nobody has any idea how many tigers we had in 1947. All we know is we had 18,023 counted tigers in Project Tiger. One. Point number two, between 1875 and 1925, 80,000 tigers were killed as vermin, 150,000 leopards, and 200 wolves. These are figures actually counted by Mahesh Rangarajan sitting in the National Archives because all of them yes, were paid for. All right? Also, finally, um, the issue really is only about four or less than 4% of our, of our landmass is within the national park and sanctuaries. And they are also under attack. Whereas the tiger That's population right. is going up, your forest cover is going down, you're going to have animal and uh, human Man, conflict animal all conflict, the time. Absolutely. It's not going to go away. The only animal with which you will not have a human animal conflict, incidentally, is the cheetah. I happen to have written a book on it, but that's for, for another day. <laughs> Yes, Thank you. Won't, but I don't know how we're going to protect the cheetahs. I mean, if they're actually Thank going to be running much. in the grasslands. Why go to the moon? Yes. Don't go to the moon. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. And anyone else wants to ask any questions, we'll yeah. be Thank you. over there.